Good afternoon. Welcome to the committee's oversight hearing on volume one of the Department of the Interior's Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative Investigative Report and a legislative hearing on S-2907, a bill to establish a Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies in the United States. The Indian Boarding School era was a dark period in our nation's history and a painful example of how past federal policy failed American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians. As the department report lays out, the federal government supported boarding schools with a primary goal in mind, the forcible assimilation of Native children into Western ways of life. These schools were key tools for suppressing Native cultures and languages, separating Native children from their families and their homelands, and indoctrinating them to, as the founder of the Carlisle School ominously said, kill the Indian and save the man. And that was not an empty promise. The brutality with which the federal government attempted to assimilate children, some as young as four years old at these boarding schools is gut-wrenching. Forced labor, whippings, solitary confinement, withholding food, making older children punish younger children with corporal punishment, unsanitary and overcrowded living conditions. The shameful list goes on. We can't undo history, but we must acknowledge it. We have to look at the full scope of these failures unflinchingly and with clear minds and fresh eyes. And most importantly, we must work directly with native communities on forging a path towards healing. Recognizing the significance of this work to native communities, Lance Fisher of the Northern Cheyenne tribe is here to provide us with an opening to help us to set the tone for this important discussion. Please rise if you are able. Wow. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. As indigenous peoples of the United States, American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians were subject to the same cruel intent of federal assimilation policies and practices, and they continue to share in the impact and lasting inequities of the federal government's centuries-long drive to try to erase Native cultures. We must do all we can to right this wrong. The Department of the Interior's report, S-2907, uh, and Congress's long-term investment in the Native American language revitalization efforts are important steps to moving the reconciliation process forward. But we must work hand-in-hand -hand with the impacted communities and the families, and that is why today's hearing will focus on Native perspectives as a guide for federal, the federal government's path toward achieving truth and reconciliation, not in the abstract, but in a meaningful and real way. Our approach must also be respectful of survivors, their families, and their communities. The committee welcomes survivor testimony should they choose to share their stories. Written comments for the record may be submitted to uh, testimony at indian.senate.gov. That's testimony at indian.senate.gov. I want to thank all of the witnesses for being here today, and I'd like to um, recognize uh, Vice Chair Murkowski for an opening statement. Gunashish, Chairman Schatz, thank you for convening this hearing. As you have mentioned, it is long, long past time for the United States to come to terms with the dark and the very terrible legacy of Indian boarding schools. From 1819 to about 1969, thousands of Native children across the country, including in my home state of Alaska and your home state of Hawaii, were taken from their families and communities, often without consent, and relocated to boarding schools thousands of miles from their homes. These boarding schools attempted to, quote, break Native children in order to quickly assimilate them into the dominant white culture. And as part of this breaking process, Native children were stripped of their identity, their language, their culture, and often forcibly. Many of these students never returned home. Federal government policy during this time was to use education as, quote, a weapon against Native people to accomplish the goals of replacing Native cultures and dispossessing Native peoples of their land. Mr. Chairman, you, you, um, mentioned the, uh, the, the words that came from Richard Henry Pratt. He was the one that was credited with founding the boarding school movement, and he claimed the need to, quote, kill the Indian, save the man. And unfortunately, American history is full of such individuals who somehow believed that they were helping at the time when they were actually committing extreme acts that devastated Native people. We so appreciate that we have in front of us now the, uh, the first volume on the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative Investigative Report. It covers the 408 federal government-supported Indian boarding schools that operated across 37 states and territories. 21 of those schools were located in Alaska. The sexual abuse, violence, malnutrition, solitary confinement, forced manual labor, untreated diseases, unreported deaths, and disappearances documented in this report make it very, very difficult to read. And we know it just scratches the surface, unfortunately, of what actually happened. Secretary Holland, I want to acknowledge your work uh, on that of the committee and, and you as well, Assistant Secretary Newland for your work on this painful issue, for your com commitment to ensuring the department provides indigenous people with access to what you have called trauma-informed support. So uh, there is deep appreciation for that. I have had an opportunity um, just last year on the National Day of Remembrance for Indian Boarding Schools to speak uh, of some of the children who have been impacted by these policies. I spoke of Sophia Titoff, a young, uh, a Nungan girl who was taken from Alaska as an orphan and brought to the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania. Uh, I spoke also of Anastasia Oshkawak from Kodiak who was taken to an orphanage after her mother passed away and, and her story and the effort for, for her family in Alaska to, to finally um, return the remains of young Anastasia to Kodiak for reburial. These are, these are hard stories, and of course, they're not isolated to Alaska. They're so similar, unfortunately, to so many Native children's stories that are just beginning to be recounted. 
I think we rec recognize that repatriation of native remains to their homelands is part of the healing process associated with these atrocities. So I'm interested to hear more about how the department will comply with and enforce uh, NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Um, we know that our, our neighbor to the east in Canada is dealing with its own history and legacy of Indian boarding schools and have established the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. A lot to be learned from that. Senator Warren and I have been working on this and we're, we're working on the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policy S2907. These are, these are, again, efforts for the United States to step up uh, to address and acknowledge the, uh, the dark history uh, that we face, but also to go further than that, to, to help bring healing to, to Native people. We've got a great panel here this afternoon, and I'm looking forward to that. At the appropriate time in the second panel, Mr. Chairman, I would like to be the one to introduce and, and welcome uh, Ms. Liz uh, Lacrine Medicine Crow. Liz is uh, the President and CEO of First Alaskans Institute and has been instrumental in so many of these issues, but I will speak to that at the appropriate time. But know that I appreciate the interest of the full committee in this very, very, very important issue. Thank you, Vice Chair uh, Murkowski. And now uh, Senator Cortez Masto for an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman uh, Schatz and Vice Chair Murkowski for holding this important hearing. I want to welcome Secretary Hall and Assistant Secretary Newland for joining us here. This hearing cannot be more relevant for our tribal communities in Nevada. Um, I, I want to take a moment to highlight the recent work done in our state, the opening of the Stewart Indian School Cultural Center and Museum. Um, not far from the Nevada State capital of Carson City sits the Stewart Indian School. It was opened by the federal government from 1890 to 1980, one of three such schools in Nevada. The Stewart Indian School opened with the stated purpose of addressing indigenous education. In reality, the school is meant to erase native culture and identity. Today, we have learned that thousands of students who are enrolled at the Stewart School were forced to forget their languages and were often prevented from seeing family members. Alumni that I have talked to have recalled being kidnapped by government officials and taken to the school where their hair was cut off by school staff. Letters from the school's archives make it clear that families were not informed when their children were sick or had even passed away. In fact, nearly 100 unmarked graves have been identified in the school cemetery. These stories show only a sliver of the cruelty and abuse that Native children had at the Stewart Indian School and what they endured. But they highlight how important it is for us to continue to learn more about this painful chapter in our history and to give space for acknowledgement and for healing. I commend the alumni and their descendants, as well as the Native Indian Cultural Commission for their hard work in opening this cultural center and dedication to working in partnership with Interior on the Secretary's Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. I look forward to hearing the testimony today on this important issue. I thank each and every one of you for being here. And again, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Senator Cortez Masto. Senator Lujan. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Vice Chair Murkowski, thank you both the, for holding this important hearing today to examine the legacy of federal Indian boarding school policies and to support legislation that moves us in the right direction. I also want to say thank you and welcome to our friend, uh, Secretary Deb Holland. Um, it's an honor to call her a friend and a mentor and to see the tremendous work that you are doing. Um, I will be forever moved by you, Deb. Um, I also want to welcome some students from New Mexico that I had the honor of meeting with earlier, and I believe the Secretary did as well, from the Santa Fe Indian School and Princeton University's Summer Policy Academy. Uh, they're led by a dear friend of mine, the former governor of Cochiti Pueblo, Regis Pecos, Preston Sanchez, who is the co-counsel um, and also the justice director and has also been involved with, with many issues and titles. But Taryn Aguilar, Amber Garcia, and Lee Mountain, I wanna thank each and every one of you for being with us today. And I understand that Michaela Sweena might also be a uh, part of the leadership group that is here. 
But Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter a letter of the students into the record that recommends Congress introduce legislation to formally apologize for generational harms resulting from the federal Indian boarding schools and policies. And I urge my colleagues to support this call for a formal apology and thank these young leaders for their advocacy, for their voices, for the past, for the future, and for current generations. And uh, with your permission, I'd like just to read a, a paragraph from here before consideration for adoption. Um, I quote, a general principle we are taught early on is to apologize for our wrongdoings and to take responsibility for our actions. Since the recent release of the boarding school report, one might think the U.S. would seek to undo the long-term trauma and harm inflicted upon Native children by boarding schools. As of today, however, this is not the case. For that reason, my colleagues and I seek a formal apology in the form of legislation to restore balance among our communities and enable positive opportunities for indigenous people to heal. By doing so, congressional leaders would signify that our education, language, culture, and traditions are important. It would also signify that indigenous people will never again be subjected to a school system that seeks to erase our cultural identity. And I would ask for unanimous consent to that be entered into the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. We are pleased to have uh, the author of the legislation in question um, as a guest of our committee. Um, it gives us pleasure to introduce uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren from Massachusetts. Thank you very much, Chairman Schatz. It is a privilege to be here with the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. And I want to say a very special thank you to you and to Vice Chair Murkowski for your leadership and your support on this issue. I am here today to discuss my bill that's a focus of today's hearing, the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies Act. I thank the many co-sponsors of this bill, including Vice Chair Murkowski, thank you for your work on this, and Chairman Schatz, thank you for your work on this, and a majority of this committee. This bill would establish a Truth and Healing Commission to formally investigate what are known as the Indian boarding school policies. These were horrifying practices carried out by the federal government to strip Native children of their indigenous identities, beliefs, and languages. Between 1819 and 1969, these policies formally removed children from their tribal lands and their families and placed them in over 400 boarding schools. It has been estimated that by 1926, nearly 83% of American Indian and Alaska Native children were in one of the currently known Indian boarding schools. Native children were subjected to harrowing human rights violations, including spiritual, physical, industrial, psychological, and sexual abuse. They were neglected and they were traumatized. Many never returned to their families. The Department of Interior has already identified more than 50 burial sites at these schools, many of them unmarked, and that number is expected to rise. These policies also affect Native Hawaiian children. For over a century, the United States supported several boarding schools across the Hawaiian Islands and repressed Hawaiian culture. The full effects of these policies have never before been appropriately addressed by the federal government. In 2020, I worked with the committee's first witness, my friend, Secretary Deb Holland. While she was serving in Congress, we introduced this legislation to formally, formally investigate these policies and to respond to ongoing historical and intergenerational trauma afflicting tribal communities today. I reintroduced this bill last year with Representatives Sharice Davids and Tom Cole, the co-chairs of the Congressional Native American Caucus. I also wish to acknowledge the invaluable partnership of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition and many other extraordinary stakeholders who are here with us today. When Secretary Holland assumed her current role, 
She continued her outstanding work by launching the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative and working with the assistant with Assistant Secretary Newland to make this happen. I am glad that this hearing will address the first volume of the Department of the Interior's report because it contains many important findings and recommendations. In particular, I would like to highlight the report's conclusion that, quote, the federal government has not provided a forum or opportunity for survivors or descendants of survivors of federal Indian boarding schools or their families to voluntarily detail their experiences in the federal Indian boarding school system, end quote. My legislation would address this gap by establishing a commission that would have five years to formally investigate boarding schools and to document their enduring impacts. The commission would hold culturally respectful and meaningful hearings for victims, for survivors, and for other community members to share their stories. Throughout the process, the commission would develop recommendations for the federal government to acknowledge and to heal trauma caused by these policies, including the establishment of a support hotline for survivors and for affected communities. This work will be painful, but it is long overdue. To the witnesses and the survivors who are sharing their experiences and the impact of these policies, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for raising your voices. Your voices are vital to this undertaking. I look forward to working with the committee to advance this legislation and to address the, the disgraceful legacy of the Indian boarding school policies. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to be with you today. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to our first panel. And we are pleased to have the Honorable Deb Holland, the Secretary of the Department of Interior, uh, accompanied by the Assistant Secretary, uh, the Honorable Brian Newland. Uh, as you know, uh, Madam Secretary, your full testimony will be made part of the official hearing record. Please keep your statement to no more than five minutes so that members may have time for questions. And for the information of the audience, there, there are a couple of ongoing votes on the floor, so you'll see members uh, shuffling in and out of this uh, room uh, but not for a lack of interest, but just because we have to cast a couple of votes. Uh, Secretary Holland, please proceed. Hello and good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chairman Murkowski, and members of the committee. Guwazi haupa, duhenume itzakiwitsa shui mihanu. It is deeply meaningful for me to speak to you from the ancestral homelands of the Anacostan and Piscataway people. Thank you for the opportunity to present the department's testimony at this important oversight hearing on the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative and S-2907, a bill to establish the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies in the United States. The Biden-Harris administration is determined to make lasting, a lasting positive difference in response to the trauma that Federal Indian Boarding School policies have caused. I would also like to thank my dear friends, Senator Warren and co-chairs of the Congressional Native American Caucus, Representative Sharice Davids and Tom Cole for prioritizing leg legislation to address these policies. For over a century and a half, the federal government, including the Department of the Interior, forcibly removed indigenous children from their families and communities and many never returned home. This intentional targeting and removal of Native children to achieve the goal of forced assimilation was both traumatic and violent. The consequences of federal Indian boarding school policies were inflicted on generations of children, some as young as four. As the head of the Department of the Interior and as the first Native American cabinet secretary, I am in a unique position to address the lasting impacts of these policies I now have direct oversight over the very department that operated and oversaw the implementation of the federal Indian boarding school system. I am a product of these horrific assimilation era policies. My grandparents were removed from their families to federal Indian boarding schools when they were only eight years old and forced to live away from their parents, culture, and pueblos until the age 13. 
My family story is similar to many Indigenous family stories in this country, which is why on June 22, 2021, I announced the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative, a comprehensive effort to address the troubled legacy of Federal Indian Boarding School policies. I am incredibly proud of the work by Assistant Secretary Newland and his entire team on Volume 1 of the investigative report that is a critical part of this initiative. It lays the groundwork for the continued efforts of the department to address the intergenerational trauma created by this federal policy. I want to note that the vast majority of the work was done by indigenous staff who worked through their own trauma and pain to meet this moment. This marks the first time in our over 200 years since the Indian boarding school policies were implemented that the United States has formally reviewed or acknowledged the extensive scope and breadth of this piece of our history. The department's investigation focuses on the historical Indian boarding school system and cultural assimilation and removal policies. The initial investigation shows that between 1819 and, 18, and 1969, the federal Indian boarding school system consisted of 408 federal Indian boarding schools across 37 states or then territories including 21 schools in Alaska and seven schools in Hawaii. Volume one also identifies approximately 53 different schools that contain marked or unmarked burial sites. As the investigation continues, we expect the number of identified burial sites to increase along with more definite numbers of identified Indian boarding school sites, children and operating dates of the facilities. Our obligations to Native communities mean that federal policy should fully support and revitalize Native health care, education, languages, and cultural practices that prior federal Indian policies sought to destroy. The department working with relevant sister federal agencies will also work to expand tribal communities' access to mental health resources. I recently announced that we will embark on the road to healing, a tour throughout the nation to hear directly from survivors and descendants about their experiences. A necessary part of this journey will be to connect survivors and their families with mental health support and to create a permanent collection of oral histories. We know this won't be easy, but it is a history that we must learn from if we are to heal from this tragic era in our country. I am proud of the work the department is accomplishing to confront its role in these assimilation policies through education. I am also deeply grateful to Congress for their support. Funding for our initiative will enable the department to help expand existing school pro profiles following volume one of the report, including detailing the number of children who attended federal Indian boarding schools, identifying marked and unmarked burial sites, identifying interred children, and detailing the amount of federal support for the system. I am grateful for the committee's leadership and also considering S2907 as part of this hearing, which I led with my colleagues when I served in Congress. The administration strongly supports this legislation, especially the, the development of the national survivor resources to address the intergenerational trauma and the inclusion of the commission's formal investigation and documentation practices. Federal Indian boarding school policy is a part of America's story that we must tell. While we cannot change that history, I believe that our nation will benefit from a full understanding of the truth of what took place and a focus on healing the wounds of the past. Thank you for inviting me to testify today and I am confident that together we can strengthen Indian country and the Native Hawaiian community now and for future generations. Um, Assistant Secretary Brian Newland and I are pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary. Um, I'll start with a couple of questions about these listening sessions. Um, can you just talk about how you're going to conduct them and how you're going to integrate the mental health services piece? 
Thank you so much for the question, Chairman. And um, yes, the primary goal of the Road to Healing is for me and Assistant Secretary Newland to hear directly from survivors, as I stated in my remarks. Um, we're working, first of all, with tribes to make sure that we are reaching out. Uh, that will help us to decide where we should have these sessions. Um, we want to make sure that we are documenting those. There will be a part where if folks want to share publicly, they can. Uh, we will close it off to the public and to any press so that if people don't want to share their story with the public, they have that opportunity as well. Um, we are in coordination with the Department of Health and Human Resources, Human Services, excuse me, uh, to direct the mental health resources for medical providers uh, at those, at the actual locations, and um, we are we will start um, with the first session in Oklahoma. Thank you. And um, can you just consider this a formal request that you? Uh, get back to us on what resources you may need in the coming appropriation cycle. A lot of uh, uh, SCIA members are also on appropriations and would be pleased to help, but decisions are getting made over the next, I would say, three to four weeks. So as soon as you can get us a uh, wish list, um, uh, the more likely we'll be able to be of assistance. Thank you, Chairman. Um, on the bill itself, uh, uh, we're... I mean, we're going to mark this up, um, and we're going to try to move it through the Congress. Uh, but do you have any recommendations for any uh, uh, friendly amendments uh, to make sure that it hits the mark in, in the ways that we want it to? We, I appreciate you asking that. And, of course, I, I just want to say how um, strongly we feel that this bill is actually complementary to the work that we're doing, uh, one of the reasons why we're wholeheartedly supporting it. Um, uh, I, I am, um, we're happy to, of course, uh, make, uh, make that, you know, happy to share with you um, our, our feelings about um, that legislation. If I could turn it over to um, Assistant Secretary Newland to sure, Secretary um, Newland. detail that out, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and thanks, Mr. Chairman, for the question. Uh, just some of the uh, uh, changes, or, or to the extent that uh, the committee and Congress are considering any, uh, would relate to the composition of the advisory committee. Uh, for example, uh, the legislation um, uh, points to the Bureau of Indian Education. The Bureau of Trust Funds Administration has been um, in, uh, central to putting together the report uh, that we published earlier this year. Uh, because of their record keeping function. And so um, we would want to make sure that the Bureau of Trust Funds Administration is included in the uh, commission and the advisory uh, committee structure, as well as the National Archives, um, which we've partnered with uh, for getting information. Um, and, and, you know, they have millions of pages of uh, federal records in their possession that are going to be important to this work. So those are those are two examples. Okay, and and, and just uh, consider this a, a request for TA uh, to make sure that. And look, we're like I said, we're going to pass this thing, um, certainly out of committee and hopefully out of the whole Senate. Mm -hmm. um, but we want to make sure that it's aligned with what you're already doing, and and we're not tripping over a new statute that is not exactly what you're sort of you already have underway. And then we need to resource it. Um, and then I, I guess my, my final question, and I talked to you about this, Secretary, is the role of native language in, um, in restoration. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to that. Well, yes, of course. It, it's, um, it comes up a lot because during the terrible federal Indian boarding school era, children were cut off from their language. Um, and it happened in public school as well as boarding schools. Uh, my mother, uh, she had her hands hit with a piece of rubber hose every time she spoke Karis. It's one of the reasons why she didn't want to teach us Karis, our native language, because she was worried and scared. And so you can see how easily it would be to 
to have generations of non-native speakers because their parents are worried about the future of their children. So um, we are wholeheartedly in support. This administration is in support of language revitalization. Um, First Lady Dr. Jill Biden and I got to travel to Oklahoma to visit the Cherokee Immersion School, uh, a, a very fine example of how tribes are taking charge of teaching their languages. And um, we, we feel that that is one way to um, gain culture back for so many of the children in 2022 who have lost it because of the history of what happened. Thank you. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Holland, as we, as, as we have looked at this report, as you have noted in, in your opening remarks, there are some 53 marked or unmarked burial sites that we know right now of, of students who died at these schools. There was an article about a month ago in the Anchorage Daily News uh, detailing about the family of Mary uh, Kinnanook. She's a Clinkett girl who attended Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania. Um, she died at the school just apparently shortly after her 14th birthday. And her family thinks that uh, she could be at, uh, her remains could be at one of those unmarked graves in the school's cemetery. So to the, the Kinnanook family and to others, um, who are trying to bring bring their children home? What resources or services, if any, does the department have to provide to the families that are seeking repatriation of family remains from from any of these former Indian uh, boarding school sites? Is there assistance to the families? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chairman. So um, Carlisle in particular, it's now an Army War College. And so uh, I actually went to Carlisle to help some tribes repatriate um, uh, children from that cemetery back to their um, native homeland in South Dakota. Um, the Army was incredibly helpful. Um, it's, it's the, they took the responsibility on to help the families go through the entire process. Uh, of course, we are there to make sure that the tribe's wishes and the family's wishes are, um, are met. And so we would welcome the opportunity to help that particular family uh, with that, um, with finding, you know, finding the answers that they need. And so um, certainly we would be happy to work with your office to reach out to them. Um, so, so I understand from the answer, though, it's not necessarily an opportunity where you can go directly for resources to help help your your family from Alaska traveling to to Pennsylvania or to to research records. It's working with Army. It's working with Department, kind of a, on a case by case basis. Do you think that there will be anything more formally structured where where families might be able to turn for some level of assistance? As as you know, we tribal consultation is incredibly important to us. It's the most important thing in the this work that we're doing. Um, when we consult with tribes, if that's an issue they would like for us to move forward, we absolutely will move it forward. Um, of course, it's it's hard to know um, a budget for something like that, but uh, but certainly um, it is, those are things that we, it, I mean, we need to consider everything and we need to consider every tool in the toolbox when we're working with uh, people. The point is that we want to make this a healing process. And if that is what the tribes and the families want, we will find a way to do what we can. And I will, I will just uh, add to that. Um, we, had a, we had a hearing earlier this year in, in this committee to discuss, um, again, the, the NAGPRA Act and how it's applied to protect tribal funerary objects patrimony and, and remains. At that hearing, we had an, another Alaskan testify, Dr. Rosita Worrell, who shared the unique institutional arrangements that govern the administration of services and certain federal laws that impact um, Alaska Native communities. And as we are, as we are moving forward, um, 
and you in the department are identifying additional burial sites as the investigation continues, I would would ask that um, you take into consideration the unique tribal government structures that we have in Alaska, invite the, the relevant tribes, the Alaska Native Corporations, to do exactly what you're talking about, which is the consult, and to be able to provide input to the department regarding NAGPRA and, and other federal the relevant federal laws that are out there as, as we're working through this boarding school initiative. Absolutely. Good. Yes. And then very briefly, um, because the chairman had raised this with regards to the legislation itself and S-2907, I understand that you've, you've, you've identified um, this is legislation that you want to work with us to pass. One of the authorities that's granted to the commission in the bill is subpoena authority. And some of my colleagues have raised this. They want to understand better why we need to provide the authority to the commission. Is it fair to assume that the department sees the subpoena power as necessary for the commission? Is, is, is that something that you want to see included? Or are there perhaps other options that could be used to gain needed information absent subpoena uh, authority? We, we support the bill as it is written, okay. Vice Chairman. Okay, good. Uh, since Senator Schatz is at the vote, we will turn to Senator Smith. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that, Vice Chair Mikowski. Uh, Secretary Holland, it is so wonderful to welcome you to the committee, and I also just want to send greetings to uh, representatives and leaders of the um, of the, the NABS leaders that are here today. I see uh, Sandy there and all of you. I'm just, uh, it feels very meaningful to have you all in this committee room since the last time I saw you was when Secretary Holland was coming to visit um, in Minnesota and we went to the Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. It was a powerful meeting. Um, so I'm very grateful to be able to have you all here today to address uh, the tragic history of this federal policy. The federal Indian school boarding, uh, the federal Indian boarding school policy, created deep intergenerational harm to Native communities across the United States. And so many of the issues that we talk about in this committee, um, health challenges, educational disparities, loss of Native languages, mental and behavioral and physical health challenges, all are tied directly to the Indian boarding school policy. So, Secretary Holland, I know that uh, you are committed to addressing this issue in a holistic way. After all, people are people. They're not divided up into different policy areas. Could you just um, expound a little bit on your opening statement and talk a little bit about how you see bringing a holistic approach to this issue across the work of the department as we move forward? And I should say I'm a strong supporter of Senator Warren's bill, the Truth and Healing Commission uh, uh, bill. I think that that will be an important um, tool um, to support uh, the work that you are doing at the agency, but could you just expound a little bit on how you see that kind of holistic approach um, fulfilling itself in the department? Absolutely, and thank you for the question, and, and yes, thank you for um, hosting us when we were in Minnesota. I, um, so first of all, what I'll say is that with respect to, to the work that we are doing, um, and the, and the priority of this administration, it's using an all of government approach to ensure that we are addressing the needs of Indian country. Our, we have um, trust obligations to Indian tribes. And so um, when I mentioned the fact of um, health and human services, you know, figuring how to make sure we are fight, um, providing trauma related support, um, language revitalization comes under our department. We also have, um, with respect to our department, we also have the American Indian Records Repository, for example. It's based near <coughs> Kansas City, Kansas, um, with um, hundreds of thousands of documents that, um, that, are, that we will be um, uh, researching to make sure that we are not leaving anything um, out of the, re the future reporting that we have to do. Um, with respect to Indian Affairs, we're, um, as I said, we have a trust responsibility to tribes. That's for healthcare, education, uh, economic development, housing. 
all those things um, that will also include um, uh, the entire administration, um, we will absolutely work to make sure that everyone is, is a part of this and fulfilling our mission. I mean, the bottom line is that that trust responsibility is real. Mm -hmm. Those are obligations that the federal government has to Indian tribes. Um, past administrations going back hundreds of years didn't always understand that obligation um, as it was meant to be. And so um, we feel confident that, that we can um, make that a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I hear in your comments that this is a um, this is an understanding of the obligation and also I would say the kind of the opportunity to make real progress that is shared by, um, as you say, because it's a whole of government approach, it's shared by the entire administration. It's not the Department of Interior kind of fighting against the machine. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, um, I know that I'm just about out of time. I want to just um, say to the committee that the work that is being done by the um, by the NABS organization in um, Minnesota, it's national work, and the incredible effort that is being made to um, bring the story of the impacts of the um, boarding school era, bring all those stories together, um, is it's really powerful, and it, it gives individuals a way to connect into their part of the story, at the same time that they're understanding the broader um, implications of that policy kind of across whole populations. Um, it is really impressive. And it reminds me that um, if you really want to understand the story, you have to know it first. And then, of course, the next step is to take action to repair the damage that's done. It gives me great hope to know that that work is happening. And I want to just thank you for that. Thank you. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member. Um, I am so pleased we're having this hearing as well. Secretary Holland, thank you. I, I want to go back to um, your testimony. Um, and, and you noted in your testimony that you would welcome the committee's assistance in access to records that are not under federal control. Could you address that? And, and then also, um, does S2907, which I support, would that help address accessing or get, obtaining those records? Absolutely. With the subpoena power, it would um, mean everything. Uh, I think um, there have been a lot of folks for decades who have tried to get records. Um, it's difficult doing that as an individual. Um, and so, um, and, I, and, I, and I also um, understand that some entities may need a subpoena before they're allowed to release certain records. So um, I think that portion of the, of the law is, or the bill is incredibly important. I would really um, appreciate it if um, Assistant Secretary Ulan could um, actually expound on that a little bit. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and, and thank you, Senator. It's it's great to see you and, and be back in front of the committee. Um, it, it, Secretary Holland said that the the bill is is broader in scope than our work has been to date, and and would uh, in establishing the commission and and providing uh, the mission and objectives for for the commission, along with the subpoena authority, would give uh, the commission the ability to. Uh, seek out that information from uh, non-federal entities um, and to do a, a deeper dive over a longer period of time um, with the would, five... Would that, uh, excuse me, would that be state entities, local government entities, private entities, or a combination of all three? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's helpful. And, and that's why um, I, I do think uh, some of them require that subpoena. They want to turn it over, but they also require some sort of federal um, subpoena to, to uh, be able to do so. So thank you. Uh, and that's why I, I think it is important we have that uh, ability to obtain those records. Let me, um, you heard in my statement, um, I am so pleased we have Nevada Indian Cultural Commission. They've done an incredible job in our state. Um, and I know they're working um, in partnership with, the, uh, with you, Madam Secretary, uh, and your Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. Um, in volume one of the report, um, 
the section on identifying and cataloging unmarked and marked burial sites at boarding schools notes that the department faced several limitations to complete this aspect of the investigation, including budget and appropriations restrictions. Now, I, I, if you could elaborate now on that, I would, I would like to hear that. If not, we can put it in writing, but I'm curious, because what do we need to do to make sure uh, we give you the tools you need and resources you need to address this? Yep, thank you. That's actually um, a great question for Assistant Secretary Newland as well. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Secretary and Senator. Thanks for that question. Um, in addition to the, uh, you know, the pandemic uh, limiting our physical access uh, to some of these records, um, you know, we were working within our uh, existing appropriations authority and our existing appropriations amounts um, uh, with the, the team that we had in place. And so it really limited uh, the scope of, of the work that we could do um, uh, you know, with our existing staff. And so the, the appropriation that Congress provided for uh, FY22 has been uh, very important for allowing us to continue this work and build out the profiles for each of the schools listed in the report. And we'll also, um, related to that, will also allow us um, to do a closer look at each school that we have on our list and, and uh, do a better job of understanding um, where these uh, cemeteries and burial sites are, are located, and then also begin the work of um, trying to put together a plan to uh, work with Indian Country to protect those sites. Okay. Thank you. So, so what I'm hearing is you need additional appropriations, additional dollars in the current appropriations, or you have enough? Um, it, the president has requested an additional $7 million in the FY23 budget. And that's what you're referring to? That would help you further with your investigation? Yes. And, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Secretary, thank you. <laughs> Senator Tester. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for holding this hearing. And it's great to have Secretary Holland here today. And her left-hand man, only because you sitting to your left, Secretary Holland, Brian Newland. It's always good to have you in the committee, too, Brian. Um, so I, I want to start by thanking the Secretary for coming to Montana, and we met with the tribal leaders in Montana, and we heard from every one of them uh, about the boarding school situation and its impacts on each one of their tribes. So there is no doubt that the, the impacts of, of what happened is are real and that we need to do something about it. Uh, the conversation around native language is an interesting one because it's something that we've been talking about on this committee for uh, a decade or longer. And the benefits are obvious, and you know this, uh, Madam Secretary, uh, the benefits of reconnection with the culture, the benefits with improving self-esteem for students, the benefits of better grades, uh, uh, staying in school, uh, lower dropout rates, uh, better attendance, better graduation rates, all that stuff makes a big difference. So uh, could you, Madam Secretary, tell me what existing programs in the BIA can help in the goal of cultural and language re revitalization in Native communities, and how do you envision them fitting into the rec recommendations that are outlined in this report? Thank you, Senator, for that quest, that important question. And I mean, I'll just say um, right off the bat that that depends on what the tribes want uh, for their communities. I mentioned earlier that the Cherokee Nation uh, started an immersion school, a Cherokee immersion school for their students, uh, starting from elementary school up to um, high school. Um, that is ideal for them. We are, that is the reason that we are doing tribal consultation on these issues. Uh, we want to make sure that whatever we are doing is supporting what the tribe wants for their own communities. And uh, of course, we have the tremendous support of President Biden um, in this effort, and um, we look forward to moving it forward. Uh, okay, it's been very good. So how is the Department of Interior working with tribes and organizations that have already begun some aspects of the of the work, uh, such as the State of Maine's Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Senator, I'm not quite, I apologize. Could you ask the question? I have a little 
bit of a trouble hearing you as well. So if you could no just problem. ask. I'll, I'll try to talk louder. How is the Department of Interior working with tribes and organizations that have already begun some of the aspects of this work? such as the State of Maine's Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Well, I think it's really our job to make sure that we are supporting tribes in, the, in whatever way is the best way um, possible for them. Um, of course, that is, that's always helped by a budget that is, um, that is kind and, and supportive of those efforts that tribes want to make, but um, we are working with, um, with tribes every single day. As you know, they're all different. They see, uh, they see truth, they see healing, uh, they see justice in different ways. And so uh, it's up to us to make sure that we're consulting and uh, supporting, and it, whether it's technical support or monetary support, um, programmatic support, however we can do that, um, that's what we will do. Thank you. In the minute I have left, I, I want to move away from the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative and, and talk a little bit about consultation. Uh, look, the BIA and Indian Health Service does cons consultation and they do a pretty good job of it in most cases. Um, other departments, other agencies either aren't aware of the necessity for consultation or just don't think they have the time to do it. Since you're a Native American secretary of the Department of Interior, you have a unique insight into the value of consultation. Have you been able to do anything within the administration to educate other agencies, other cabinet level officials about the importance of consultation? And if you have, has it shown any results that are positive? Oh, uh, absolutely. Thank you, Senator. As you know, we, we reconvened, President Biden reconvened our White House Council on Native American Affairs. That's been incredibly important. All the cabinets, all my colleagues, we meet um, um, regularly to make sure that we're moving uh, the issues for Indian country forward. And I think that not only has um, this, this new era of Indian country um, yielded um, tribal consultations that are incredibly meaningful, but it is also translated into the various departments hiring Native people at high levels, um, um, consult, um, um, advisors and senior level uh, department um, employees that can help move the department, their departments forward in the ways that they, um, that are best suited to um, move that tribal um, the uh, trust obligations forward. So I think it's, um, I think everyone, um, all of my colleagues um, have been um, extremely um, optimistic and, um, and amenable to, to, these, to moving all of these issues forward. Well, thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Secretary, and thank you, Brian Newland, for being in front of the committee. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Tester. I have a quick couple of questions for, for the Secretary. Um, this work is necessarily going to involve more departments, you know, a, a fair amount of interdepartmental cooperation. And I guess my first question is, have you run into any bureaucratic administrative roadblocks? Um, and the second question is, can I have your assurance that if you do, you will come right to us. I mean, you can go right to the White House. I know you have that option as well, but we're we're pleased to be of assistance here. And um, I wanna make sure that, um, you know, the Department of Defense had a role here, the Department of War. And um, th they can they are capable of being pretty slow in responding to something that they don't consider uh, to be core to their mission. And I wanna make sure that we're sort of on top of all the other agencies. I have no doubt you'll move with, great alacrity, but I want to make sure that um, we have the interdepartmental cooperation that we need. Thank you, Chairman. I, I, I'll give um, Assistant Secretary Newland an opportunity to address this also, but um, from the time I wrote my op-ed uh, about this issue, which was over a year ago, um, we have had 
um, really incredible support from my colleagues um, across the administration. And I think that everyone sees this as part of America's story. It's not just Indian history, it's American history. And, and, and it affects all of us in the way that we go about our lives. And so um, I feel confident that we'll be able to find the support across uh, the departments um, that we need. And certainly we would, we would absolutely uh, come to you if we, um, if we had some issues you could help us with. But I, I would love to give- uh, Well, let me try to get one more question then before oh, I move on to Senator Daines. Um, how do you see um, the department working um, with with the agents, with your counterparts in Canada? Because I think they're at least chronologically a little bit ahead. And I'm just wondering what there is to learn there and maybe what differentiates uh, us from our friends. I mean, I call them our friends to the north. Uh, Lisa called them our friends to the east. I had to sort of do the... <laughs> you had to get a mental math in, <laughs> yes. in your head. Um, well, uh, of course, I, we haven't been in contact with um, with our counterparts in Canada regarding this particular issue. Um, although um, I have read uh, quite a bit ab about um, what they are going through as well. And, um, you know, before colonization, there was no Canadian-American border. Uh, there were tribes living in, on this continent, and we're all relatives. We all share a history together, and we all um, care and, and love one another. And so I, I will just say that however I can be helpful to any indigenous people, um, I will absolutely... Um, be honored to to be of assistance in that way. So um, I think that our um, the reason that we have experienced some of the same history is because we're essentially the same people. And so um, we'll just I'll I'll just be ready to help whenever I can. And and certainly I think we always have something to learn from each other. Yeah, I think that was my point is that let's find out what they're doing. Let's find out if they stub their toe in some way that looks obvious in retrospect so we can avoid making any mistakes that they're uh, that they made in the first instance and, and just sort of coordinate our efforts. Obviously, they're not going to be the same, but they are our friends to the north. This is at least um, conceptually um, the same effort. Um, and to your point, for the same people. So we want to know what they're learning as they go along and make sure that um, we're learning from each other. Senator Daines. Chairman Schatz, thank you. Secretary Holland, thanks for being here. And before we get into the topics on hand, I want to thank you and your team for your leadership and your help on what's happened with the Yellowstone floods. Um, it's been an um, all-hands-on-deck moment. Um, I'm hearing really good things on the ground from Cam Shaw and others about your leadership, uh, Director Sam's leadership, on the response and support they're receiving them. They're working 20-hour days right now uh, to get back on their feet. So uh, just a heartfelt thank you from the people of Montana, from Idaho, from Wyoming, who all share boundaries around that amazing treasure of Yellowstone National Park. And we will rebuild it stronger than it was before. Thank you. Um, well, I also want to thank you for being here for this important conversation and thank you for the department's work so far to bring light to the atrocities that occurred under the Federal Indian Boarding School program. This issue strikes deep into the hearts of Montanans. It's not something that we should take lightly or half-heartedly, but it's something that we need to put our effort behind so that the truth and the stories can be uncovered. Montana was home to 18 known boarding schools located across the state, affecting many of our tribal communities. Each community will have different experiences and needs, and it's important that as the department continues its investigation work, that uh, you and we, we all work closely with each and every tribe and tribal community that were subject to the boarding school program. My question, Secretary Holland, uh, will you commit to working with all Montana tribes 
to ensure their voices and stories are heard as the department moves forward with the investigation. Absolutely. Absolutely, Senator. We're, we're committed to working with each and every tribe. Um, they suffered right along with, with so many other tribes, so yes. Thank you. Um, my follow-up on that would be, how will the department ensure that there are detailed investigations into the specific ramifications that each individual tribe has had to deal with? Thank you for that question. And of course, you know that we had volume one of this um, report. Um, we're going on a, um, a healing journey across the country um, and we'll be able to speak to individuals from individual tribes. Um, and then of course, our uh, research will, will continue to move forward. Um, a second volume, of course, would have d more details about children, about each school, about each tribe. And so we hope to get with um, incredible specificity so that uh, the tribes have opportunities to decide what they'd like to do with that information. Thank you, Secretary Holland. Um, and I know there'll be a lot of focus on what's happened in the past as part of the healing process as you just described. But as we continue to bring light to what happened in the past, I think it's important we must ensure that we use these findings to guide our actions in the present as well as looking into the future. How can the department ensure that we are promoting tribal sovereignty, the tribal culture, the language, and history at existing BIE schools across Montana? Well, um, thankfully, uh, that is happening now. We are, um, every BIA school that we operate, and, and Secretary Newland can speak to this in more specificity, but we are, a lot of those schools, they have native teachers, native principals, native superintendents. We, there is a culturally relevant education for every native student at every single one of those schools, and um, that will absolutely continue. Secretary Holland, thank you. Thanks for being here. And again, um, thanks for your uh, great support on this issue as well as helping us out west in Yellowstone. And, and Senator, if I could just say thank you for, for the Yellowstone comments. Um, I'm happy that you recognize it's, it's the career staff who, um, who live, eat, and breathe um, their jobs, and we're, we're incredibly grateful for the hard work that, um, that they are doing to make sure that this crown jewel of our country uh, returns to its um, original glory. So thank you for recognizing that. I will pass on those comments. Please do, and I will tell you, your leadership and uh, leadership from Director Sams is being noticed and felt as I've chatted again with our superintendent of the ground there and thank career you. staff. They know they have the support from, from uh, the team back here, it's very important. Thank you, thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Senator Daines. Uh, Secretary Holland, uh, Assistant Secretary Newland, um, we'll now move on to our second panel. We thank you, uh, you are excused. Um, and I, as you are moving out, um, in the interest of time, I will begin to introduce our second panelists who can take their seats um, uh, as they are able. Uh, the first, is the Honorable Kirk Francis, the Chief of the Penobscot Indian Nation in Indian Island, Maine. Uh, next, Sandra Whitehawk, President of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And my friend, Norma Wong, Native Hawaiian Policy Lead, Office of the former Hawaii Governor John Waihe'e in Honolulu, Hawaii and uh, to Senator Murkowski to introduce her witness. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I mentioned uh, Liz before, but I would like to officially welcome Liz Laquene Medicine Crow. She is the president and CEO of First Alaskans Institute. I know she traveled from Anchorage to be here, so thank you, Liz, for that. Uh, Ms. Medicine Crow, she is Haida and Clinkett from Cake in southeastern Alaska. She is in a Enrolled tribal citizen of the organized village of Cake. She's got a, she's got a strong uh, background um, 
uh, with a uh, Juris Doctorate, a JD from Arizona State, and a certificate in Indian law. But she not only has extensive knowledge and experience in federal Indian policy, but also with reconciling trauma, um, including the trauma associated with, with boarding and residential schools. And so, Liz, just thank you for, for not only your advocacy on behalf of, of so many, um, but uh, in assisting us with the dis discussion and the consideration of, of the legislation. I, I think this is perhaps the first time you've testified before the committee, so we're delighted to have you back here, and thank you for making the journey. Your full written testimony will be made part of the official hearing record, so we'd appreciate it if you confine your remarks to five minutes. Uh, uh, Mr. Francis, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Kirk Francis. I'm from the Penobscot Indian Nation in the state of Maine. I want to begin my testimony by thanking Secretary Deb Holland for beginning the Federal Indian Board and School Initiative and elevating the need to compile some facts and humanity around this issue. One of the main benefits to compiling this information is that Native Americans who are impacted by these schools get more educated about the facts and learn that they are not alone in this experience. At one point in time, over 100 of our children were in boarding schools, in particular the Carlisle Indian School. The impacts of that on our community are still being felt today. As chief of the Penobscot Nation, I was involved in two significant commission efforts. One was the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The other was the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission. I share my experiences of those commissions with you to help inform your views of the commission being established by S-2907. The main Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a temporary commission intended to investigate and compile information about the child welfare system in Maine. The effort was grassroots driven by tribal and state child welfare workers who agreed that the existing system was flawed. Their efforts began in 2008 the five-person commission was seated in early 2013 and released its report in June 2015. Overall, the commission, in my opinion, was a success. The commission process allowed for both sides to get educated about the issues, share their experiences and perspectives, and better understand each other. Since the commission's report, changes have been made to the state child welfare system to ensure that each Wabanaki government is able to fully participate in decisions that imp impact Wabanaki children. What I think made the commission successful was one, the tribal and state child welfare workers wanted to make the change. They would buy in, there was buy-in from the state governor and all Wabanaki governments. The commission's focus was narrowly tailored to one topic, and the commission focused its work on compiling factual information, but allowed the voices of those impacted by the system to be heard. The commission did a good job of describing its work as a conversation versus an investigation to place blame on any person or entity. The other commission I have experienced with is the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission, which is an intergovernmental entity created by the Maine Implementing Act of 1980, which is the state law that implements the federal Maine Indian land claims. This commission is comprised of 13 members, six of which appointed by the tribes, six by the state, and those 12 choose a chair. The primary purpose of this commission is to continually review the effectiveness of the Settlement Act and the social, economic, and legal relationship between the state of Maine and three of the Wabanaki nations. This commission is permanent and does not expire. Unfortunately, this commission has not been as effective in improving the relationship between the Wabanaki nations and the state. This is not the fault of the individual members of the commission but more about the structure of the commission. At times, the state has failed to fill its six spots, which impairs the ability of the commission to get its work done. Additionally, very few recommendations of the commission actually get implemented by the state or Congress. Because of this, individual members of the commission and the tribes get frustrated and question the purpose of the commission. Based on these experiences, I have several suggested edits excuse me, for the committee to consider in making uh, S-2907, but seeing my time is short, I just want to mention a couple. 
The language of S-2907 should be reviewed to make sure that it encompasses all the schools identified in Volume 1 of Interior's report. The bill seems to only include schools that were directly operated by the federal government or churches versus schools that meet the four criteria used by Interior. The members of the Commission are all appointed by the federal government, which will likely minimize trust in the Commission's work. I recommend revising the bill to require that the federal government select their appointees from people nominated by national and regional tribal organizations. Lastly, there are no next steps for what happens to the report that the Commission develops. I recommend that the bill include language that requires the Secretaries of Education, Interior, and Health and Human Services to conduct consultation about the findings and recommendations in the report and that the Committee on Indian Affairs conduct a hearing on the report in the future. I think that's about my time. I thank you for allowing me to be here, and I'm happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Francis. And uh, now we'll hear from Ms. Sandra Whitehawk, president of the Na uh, National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. My name is Sandy Whitehawk. Sichangu Lakote Mantaha. Wableni Chavo Paktav Bluhamani. I'm from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. And uh, I would first like to say thank you to our relative who opened our time uh, with a prayer song and, and his uh, companion who sang with him. I was really moved by that because it's my only second time in these halls and to hear our songs and our, our language spoke I can only think of, of our relatives who survived those horrible uh, experiences, and here we are still today. And we're told that if all you can say is who you are and where you come from, you will know where you're going to go in life and what you're going to do. And this is what our children were not given in those institutions. So it is truly an honor to, to be here. So uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Schatz. And, um, Chair, Vice Chairman Murkowski for the time and the committee members for this time. I'm flooded with all kinds of emotions that are fighting against my words. And I'm, I heard the throats almost begin to close for our Secretary, or our uh, Holland and um, Assistant Secretary Newland, and, I, and me as well because we can't speak these, speak on their behalf without seeing our own relatives' faces. How we can hear our brothers and our sisters, our aunts and our uncles and our grandmothers share their stories within our circles in our homes. The Truth Commission, the Truth and Healing Commission will give us the opportunity to have a public um, opportunity to have it validated by the public. It's one thing to share your story within your home or in your community, but it's another place to share it where it's going to be validated by the outside entities that, all, that brought this on. It brings a, a healing in itself. It addresses what we call disenfranchised grief in our communities, a grief that's not been acknowledged or uh, brought to any healing. I've witnessed this as a uh, commissioner for the Maine and Web, Maine Webinaki Child Welfare uh, Truth and Reconciliation. I was one of the five commissioners. I've also witnessed a commission in Canada as I was invited to be an honorary witness for the Truth and Reconciliation for residential schools. So I have much confidence in our CEO of NABS because she too worked within those entities and uh, has much experience in helping our communities develop that. <clears throat> so it is exceptionally important and it's just, it's time. And I, it is so encouraging to hear you speak so fervently in support of us. That, that in itself is, a, is healing, to sit and to hear in the halls that there are um, representatives who understand this history and understand the importance of hearing from us. I want to thank you for that support, and I can't wait to go back and tell my community what I heard. It will be, they're, they're going to go, 
really? And I go, yeah, it did. They did. I swear that it happened. Um, it is, it, I, there's no really, I, right now I'm kind of stunned at that acknowledgement. And to hear you say not just our hair was cut, which is vital, but, and our clothes were taken, but you understand the corporal punishment and the psychological torture. And you've spoken to that. I want to thank you for that acknowledgement. <clears throat> One last thing I want to say about our language, um, the importance of it is to remember that those of us, those of our communities who were forced not to say anything about who they were, where they come from, and yet our languages were used, not just the Navajo language, but Dakota languages, the Cheyenne language, all, many languages were used in World War II. So it, the very people who were to be eradicated through wars and uh, schools stood and fought, and they were boarding school survivors as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Norma Wong. Aloha, aloha kako. Aloha. Uh, o Norma Ryuko Kaveloku Wong ko uinoa. Uahana o ya au ma kalihi mauka ma oahune. Noho vao ma ane i, i kea manawa. Aloha, uh, my name is Norma Yuko Kaveloku Wong. I was born in Kalihi near the mountains uh, where I now live. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I apologize for not being with you in person. Instead, I am here in Kalihi and from time to time, you will have proof of that because uh, you will hear roosters uh, in the background. My grandmother was banned from the language in her youth, and she did not speak it again until two weeks before she passed. She did not tell us her story, and I did not grow up in the language. And so these few words that I have spoken here that I wrote in my formal testimony, I sent to younger Hawaiians to correct younger Hawaiians who benefited from my generation's political fight for language revitalization uh, here in Hawaii. I know that my story is common among the many Native peoples. Uh, we all experienced forced norming, uh, the stripping of language and ways, separation from land, family, and peoples. And the boarding schools were focused delivery agents for this national policy and for the peoples who lived and governed in this country at those moments in time. And so for their descendants, there is very specific pain. To account for and acknowledge uh, is a consequential precipice. And how we guide and participate in this particular moment. In my introduction, the reconnection to language just three generations later is one small example of mending the arc. The seven generations arc. The seven generations that are before us and the seven generations after. This is the worldview, the ethos, and the plumb line for all Indigenous peoples. At the center of the arc is the current generation. All the peoples, whether you are Native peoples or not, who live in this particular moment. And what is our kuleana, our responsibility to mend the arc and to pivot the trajectory for future generations? So while justice is moral, it is a hollow victory if it is not accompanied by thriving. So moving forward from the investigative report, it is critical to reach back and to cast forward. How do past actions impact us today? What is the imagined and hoped for future? What would need to happen to make that possible? To mend the arc, is to contemporaneously restore that which was cut off, not as a reparation, but in reconnecting to a fruitful path. And three areas of repair come to mind. 
language revitalization, connection of people to place, and worthiness. Language contains values and ways. It must be taught orally and reconnects the relationship between generations. Language contains the wisdom of stewardship between peoples and the land and reconnecting to the responsibilities of land and place, even in urban areas. This is critical to the reconnection of the ark. Indigenous peoples are intended to be stewards of peoples and place, not only their own, but of the entirety. And it is part of our worthiness across the span of time. In mending the ark, we must interrupt the habit of transactional repair. In its stead, to be creative and generous in our investment and partnership. Resources will be needed for grieving and therapeutic healing and gatherings. The energy of what happened in these spaces and places needs tending to if repair is to be had. Ritual, ceremony, repurposing. That is the indigenous way and making it possible for peoples at scale to have the time, the space, and the support to figure this out and to implement hopes and dreams. This is a generational journey. It is not a one and done. E na na ika opua o ka aina, observing the horizon clouds of the land. What took hundreds of years to tear to the point of breaking cannot be repaired let alone propel us toward a more thriving future over the course of a few studies, reports, and hearings. There is work to be done, and it can be fruitful. I leave with this wise saying of our peoples, Kale ha ule ole, he keki. One's child, a lay, a garland that is never cast aside. Mahalo nui, thank you so much. Mahalo. Uh, we now uh, recognize uh, Ms. Medicine Crow. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I'll try not to use my radio voice. Finish Chish How Chairman Schatz and Vice Chairwoman Senator Murkowski from Alaska. Thank you so much for your words of introduction and to the committee. Punish Chish Hoa for your time today. Like those who have spoken before me, this is not an easy subject to address. In my introduction, Senator Murkowski spoke about my heritage, that I am Haida and Tlingit, and I come from Akih uh, Kwan, the people uh, of, of the community of Kek. Our name really means mouth of the dawn people. I sit here before you as the granddaughter of a survivor. Her name was Mona Jackson. I wear her regalia here today because I wanted to bring her with me and I wanted to become a vessel for her voice and for the voice of so many of our other children are most vulnerable who were taken from our communities. They were not just taken from their communities. While we focus on the importance of the children who were taken, it is also incredibly important to focus on the communities that they were taken from. I often wonder, what would it be like to come from a place with no children? This is what was imposed on our people. Could you imagine having your own children taken? Communities without children. As was stated earlier, over 83% of our children were taken across this country. That is a staggering amount and likely has left some uncounted. I work for an organization called First Alaskans Institute, and our vision is progress for the next 10,000 years. This is a large number, which we know that we can look to because we come from over 10,000 years of history here in this place. 
And this period of the boarding schools was a short window of time that exacted so much precise damage. This was intentional and purposeful harm. This commission will finally help us tell the truth about the United States history and its relationship with its native people. When I think about the process that we have been engaged in Alaska called Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation, we used the process over the past almost 14 years to arrive at an, um, uh, a, a native value-centered process using our native people's wisdom as the subject matter experts of this work. We used a process that centered our people, that honors them, and that uplifts their voices. And in this process, we created these tribunals where we invited our community to step forward and share their truths. And in the sharing of those truths, lifting up the healing process, which I heard some questions asked about earlier, is how do you marry both a space for telling the truth with the healing that needs to happen? And those things actually go hand in hand. And so using a process that was designed by our people, for our people, and for Alaska's strength and future, we designed a process that also included accountability partners. And those accountability partners were people who represent governments, churches, social groups, private individuals, for-profit enterprise, who were ready to sit and stand beside Native people and say, we want to understand the legacy of our impact, and we want to work side by side to co-create the future that we know our children deserve. This is wisdom and knowledge that comes from our people in Alaska, our Native people, who, like so many others of our Hawaiian brothers and sisters and our lower 48 Native brothers and sisters, have learned under duress how to actually hold people up talking about incredibly hard things, and that wisdom should be tapped by this commission. I cannot thank you enough once again, and I want to leave with a story from my grandmother. My mother asked her a question about her experience with boarding schools, and my grandmother responded, I can tell you what happened physically, but I'm still not able to talk about what happened inside. And this commission will open up a pathway where these stories from people who are now elders will be heard. Time is of the essence. We cannot waste any more of their precious life with not giving them a forum to share their lived experiences. And it's Chishawa for this opportunity to share on this incredibly important bill. Thank you very much to all of our uh, testifiers. Um, my first question is for uh, Ms. Wong. Uh, you know, our last testifier talk made reference to trauma. And it seems to me that we have to act with absolute determination, understanding that moments come and go and that although we all seem to be in agreement that we need to move forward, that could vanish quickly. You, know, you just never know. And the federal government moves slowly, and so we want to make sure that they um, feel the impetus and feel the motivation and have the resources to go. But it also occurs to me that we have to do this properly, that in our uh, determination, that can't turn into haste. Um, certainly, I've learned as, as a non-Native Hawaiian residing in Hawaii for 47 of my 49 years that I know entering a space or starting a project, going into someone's home, starting a meeting in the wrong way can set a tone that is almost impossible to reverse. And so the question I have for you, Ms. Wong, is in your experience, are there best practices when it comes to attempting to reconcile personal trauma and broader community harms? In other words, how do we do that part of it right and not just start to conduct listening sessions and maybe re-traumatize people without a path forward. Mr. Chairman, 
you know, there's a, a, the trauma informed aspect of this. There's the healing informed aspect of it. And then there's the thriving informed, which is to say that especially in government uh, kinds of projects, uh, even initiatives that have as much um, requirement as this particular initiative has, which is to say that the boarding school opening up the conversations that may be possible with boarding schools uh, may be a once in a generation opportunity to pivot the entirety of the relationship that the United States government has with the native peoples of this country. And because of the possibility of that pivot, that uh, you need to actually move forward, not only with care, but with, I would say, some differentiation. And by differentiation, I would say that there is the, you recognize that there are different levels. There's a level of the individuals which would include the, uh, the survivors as well as the descendants, as well as the native peoples uh, who were not actually uh, accounted for in the boarding schools, but essentially uh, were uh, cast into the diaspora. And so they are no longer a part of any peoples that are certainly recognized uh, by the federal government and may actually be dislocated by hundreds of thousands of miles, thousands of miles uh, from the, their homeland. And they show up. They'll show up in a community center or they'll show up um, in a mental health clinic or they'll show up uh, someplace and they'll say, I remember that I am of these people, whatever those people may happen to be. So there's the levels of the individual. Uh, there's the institutional, both private and public, uh, for which an accounting is required, and also a new narration that is brought forward. And then there's the cross-community conversations that would include non-natives and would be best done on an individual basis. So this would be on a relational basis, the people that you know, and the people who know the people that you know. So uh, designing this differently and to actually implement it um, almost at the same moment, but not to use the blunt sword of, a, I, I consider a, a, a public hearing to be a blunt sword. So we can't settle for the usual. Uh, the public hearing that would have certain testimonies and that would have people that would have a time limit and things of that sort. That cannot be uh, the, the, where all of the focus happens to be. Every person and descendant needs a way to be seen or heard, be it in community or on an individual basis. And some massive national effort will actually resolve um, many things if that is done in concert with this particular effort. I would also say that support teams who are going to be used for this are going to experience their own trauma and they will need ways uh, uh, to deal with that and to deal with it in ways that are appropriate um, to their culture. Um, there is a narrative that is embedded within this country that has reverberated to this day. And so unless that narrative is rewritten, a new story is written, then these efforts will remain just within the government sphere of things. So I would say that, that it is useful for uh, the United States government to change its ways. But in the, if your neighbor who is non-native is, is not included in the new narrative and is, doesn't have a way forward, then I don't think much will change on the ground for the, um, for the peoples of this place. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, and I think it's yes or no. Uh, Ms. Whitehawk, do you think that this commission should have subpoena authority? Thank you. I don't think she was mic'd up, so for the record, that was a yes. Yes, I do, absolutely. Perfect. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Medicine Crow, I, I want to ask a question about how we are defining or the criteria used to define um, federal Indian boarding schools. And, and uh, Chief Francis, you kind of alluded to this, I think, at the end of your statement. But um, certainly in Alaska, we know that many of the boarding schools were affiliated with religious institutions. Apparently, in Interior's report here, they say that approximately 50% of federal Indian boarding schools may have received support or involvement from a religious institution, and that further, the government at times paid religious institutions and organizations for Native children to enter federal Indian boarding schools. Um, so we have, we've identified 21 schools in Alaska that we're calling federal Indian boarding schools. But really, as we look at how big the state is and the role of religious institutions in these boarding schools, I kind of feel like that that number might be low. So would you care to comment on whether you think the, the Interior Department's criteria is adequately capturing the federally supported schools that we see in Alaska and elsewhere um, are there, is there perhaps a better way to define federal Indian boarding school? And then when you've, when you've responded, maybe I'd ask you, Chief Francis, to, to comment on the same. Go ahead, Liz. Uh, goodness, Chief, for the question. Uh, yes, I think that um, what I even read within the Department of Interior's report acknowledges that their criteria was really limited. And as a result, we don't quite know uh, how many actual boarding schools were in Alaska. Uh, right now, um, you know, we know from their report there were 21, as you stated, uh, but they also acknowledged that there were over a thousand different institutions across the country that did not fit that criteria, and so they did not include it in the report. We know in Alaska that the orphanages, the boarding homes, uh, were also uh, subsidized by the federal government. Um, churches in their own right um, took it upon themselves uh, to define areas in Alaska. Um, during a, a convening, um, they came up with what we know today as the comedy plan, where the different churches sectioned up Alaska and each took a certain region of the state. And through that comedy plan, those churches enacted their own efforts um, to uh, assimilate our, our Native children. And understanding the relationship between the churches and the federal government in that role is critical and I believe will come out through this commission process. So from where I stand today, I do not think that we have an accurate number yet of the institutions that were in Alaska. The other thing that I think is important to note is that a lot of Alaska Native children were sent out of state mm -hmm. to boarding schools down south, and we do not yet know the number of those children sent to these boarding schools or orphanages or, in one instance, um, there's another institution in Oregon called the Morningside Institute where um, mentally ill Alaskans were sent. A substantial number of them were Alaska Natives and a number of them were Alaska Native children. And so figuring out this entire kind of ecosystem of assimilative process is really critical. Um, and I think that a very strict and narrow definition uh, will limit our ability to really know the full story. I appreciate the detail to that. Uh, Chief Francis, do you agree that perhaps this definition is just too limiting, too narrow? Yeah, I think, um, I think so. And I think, um, as I stated in my testimony, you know, the, the four criteria used in, in Interior's definition is much broader than, than the bill. And I think this is why a solid, robust um, consultation process throughout this is going to be extremely important to understand what each tribal communities or each region's experiences were. There are many ways that um, 
our children were affected by boarding schools, not just in the federal system, but a lot of, um, and what we found in our truth and reconciliation process um, in Maine was we started the conversation about child welfare and then that child welfare conversation went into people's experience as children in the Catholic church. We were raised or well, whatever it may be. So it, it broadened the, it will inevitably broaden to a whole host of historical trauma things related to um, the educational system uh, for children. You know, we look at the state of New York, for example, we know there's three boarding schools there that are not considered federal boarding schools, even though at periods of time throughout their history, they receive significant federal funding. So I think it's going to be um, extremely important to get that definition right. And I think uh, through a robust consultation process, um, the commission can understand, begin to understand um, the diversity of of institutions that contributed to these atrocities for native kids. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The United States poured enormous resources into federal Indian boarding schools. By comparison, the federal government has invested less than $400 million uh, in recouping the very native American languages it tried so hard to eradicate through these policies. Now, Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding that we still don't have an estimate into how much was spent by the United States into federal boarding schools, but I'm hopeful that we can get that number so that when there's comparison, and some may try to suggest that it's too expensive to support these initiatives, that people are able to take a look at how much was spent trying to take people's lives away, take language away to hurt people. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we can work towards getting that number as well and finding ways to support initiatives like the Esther Martinez Immersion Program. Now, to each of the witnesses, uh, yes or no, but if you care to ex uh, expand, I I'd appreciate that as well. Uh, my question is yes or no, in keeping with the initiative's recommendations, should Congress make bold, substantial investments in Native American language immersion, preservation, and maintenance programs? Chief? Uh, absolutely, Senator. Thank you for that. And, and the, you know, I don't know if we'll ever be able to quantify the cultural damages from from that era, but um, certainly every year it should be the follow up. When we talk in the testimony about the follow up being important to a commission report, it's it's critically important that we're having a budgetary conversation every year about addressing the cultural damages to tribes, language preservation, um, historic preservation. But ultimately, it's going to be the Native communities that are going to be left to deal with um, the Commission's report and what that, um, it'll inevitably open old wounds. It'll, it'll be a difficult time, and the communities are going to have to be able to support that historical trauma treatment. And so, unfortunately, resources are going to be a huge part of that success. President Whitehawk. Yes. I was thinking that there probably wasn't a discussion of the cost to try to eradicate the language. It would probably make sense that, um, and for sure would make sense, that we would, Congress would invest in what it took to restore what was taken. We often hear in our, our communities, people say, our, we lost our language. And, and I say, no, we didn't lose. We, it was taken. Mm. This was not something we did to ourselves. It was taken by. So it, it would make sense, and I would support that. And as uh, Chief um, Francis said, that it will open up uh, wounds, but in order for us to heal, we need to air out those wounds and replace them with the medicines that we have within our ceremonies and with our songs, along with uh, our mental health professionals that can help us as well. But most importantly, what was taken from us, which is our songs, our life ways, that it will bring the healing when our wounds are open from that. Uh, there was an elder that was one of my teachers, my most influential teachers in my life, and he said, we are a people that are well acquainted with grief. And I've watched and, and seen that as we've gone into communities and listened to experiences and watched healing take place. I heard um, Chairman Schatz mention possibly of triggering our, in, our, our relatives, but 
I don't even like to use that word trigger because a trigger's on a gun. Why, why are we using violent language, you know, possible language that leads to violence that it does remind us, but there is a, uh, something that happens when the truth is spoken. It changes minds and changes hearts and gives strength to the individual who is being heard possibly for the first time in a way that will validate their experience. It's, it's an incredible process to watch. I've been privileged to, over the last 20 years, witness healing circles, truth circles, and it is, um, it is definitely the way we need to be. And as a commissioner in Maine, uh, Chief Francis was right. We, it, everything led back to boarding school, everything, because that's where the first disruption took place of our families, of our communities, of everything. So in restoring that uh, begins that healing process. Most of all, it validates, I can't say it enough. I think of my own brother sharing what he's finally willing to a little bit to talk about and what he endured and what my other relatives endured and hearing it and, and shaking your head, singing a song, when that wound originally happened, nothing was there. They laid there in bed at night with nothing. And so hearing it, recounting it, and, and uh, the relatives being around, that's the healing process. And from that, those that are listening can use their gifts and skills to say, well, we need to do this to address this in our community. This would be helpful as we move forward our young people will take that next step for us as they would listen and hear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, President Madison Crow, yes or no? Yes, absolutely. And Ms. Wong, uh, yes or no? Yes. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, my, my time has expired, but I have other questions I'll submit into the record. Thank you for the time today, and thank you again to uh, each of the witnesses for your courage and for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lujan. I'll now recognize the vice chair for any uh, closing remarks she may uh, wish to provide. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to thank I want to thank those who have come before the committee um, for your testimony today, for your input, um, and for your your advocacy for for so many, um, knowing that it is personal for so many of you, and. Uh, I, I would commend, Mr. Chairman, as, as this committee is, is looking further into this investigation and the reports and what will follow on, that what First Alaskans Institute has, has put in place with, your, with the tribunal and the summit on, on, on boarding and, and residential schools in Alaska, um, this process that allows for the stories to, to be heard, uh, to provide for this source of healing, is, is something that um, hopefully others can look to as, as a process, as a, um, I won't, I, I hesitate to call it best practices, but I think oftentimes we look, where, where do we start? Where do we begin? How, how can we allow for a safe space for the sharing um, and knowing that it, it, it won't just be words into a room, but that by sharing, uh, that that healing can begin, and I, I, I do, I do um, recognize the the heart that has gone into the effort uh, by first first Alaskans, and and how in our state we are are beginning that those slow steps, those initial steps. There's much to be done, um, but I think we saw from uh, from those that have shared today that that we are in the beginning. Uh, in those beginning steps. So much work to do, and I appreciate the committee's attention to this. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Murkowski. I want to thank all of the testifiers uh, for their incredible testimony, of course, but also their important work going forward. This will be the beginning of an ongoing process. There's no doubt about that. Um, it is important to remember that our government did this and that we um, like to think that only other governments in other places far away 
implemented such atrocities. And it is literally hard to fathom that the United States Department of War and the United States Department of Interior remove children from their homes and punish them physically and abuse them mentally and sexually. And some and many died. Um, this was an important first step. Um, and we're going to stay on this. Um, all of the committee members are committed to this. I know the secretary is. And we will work with you, nothing about you, without you, um, um, to make sure we get this right. Senator Hoven. Mr. Chairman, if I could, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Whitehawk one question, then I could submit other questions for the record as well. And that's just as president of the National uh, Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. Um, are, you know, what are the next steps that you feel um, should be taken following the release of this first volume of the study that was done? Until we hear our communities speak their experiences, that will define our next steps that we will take. Okay, very good. Thank you. And, and again, Mr. Chairman, appreciate the witnesses being here and, and we'll submit some questions for the record as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hoven. If there are no more questions for our witnesses, members may also uh, submit follow-up written questions for the record. The hearing record will remain open for one month I want to thank all of the witnesses for their time and their testimony, and Mr. Fisher will now close this hearing.
Yeah, sure, man. Uh -huh. Thank you. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>